as well as satellite navigation mixed in. It all goes into the computer, and the best average answer of it all comes out on this machine, and we attempt to steer exactly down that line. We have to do it up here with this automatic pilot by adjusting it. Later on, if, if what we find on our seismic information is interesting to the oil company, they will probably send us or another crew out here to uh, do more detailed work. And if that detail work proves interesting, they'll send a drill out here at great expense and drill for oil. So if our information is wrong where we are, and they drill in the wrong place, uh, they liable to mess the oil pool because oil is just not everywhere underneath of us. Uh, it's quite an elusive thing, and uh, you can miss it by 100 feet, you've missed it. The recording room, immaculate, cool to a constant 68 degrees. It's personnel responsible for recording seismic, gravity, and magnetic data. Like any combat vessel in hostile waters, the day is 24 hours long. 13 men on 12-hour shifts for as many as 60 days at a time. But for half the crew, half the time, the war is over. Geophysics has come a long way. You couldn't begin to find oil today with those antique methods that we had before. That kind of oil has all been found. The easy oil has been found. Just like in the earliest days in Saudi Arabia, we didn't need geophysics at all. All you had to do was go out there and do some uh, very nice surface geology and map your structures which uh, were reflected, those structures were, which were reflected on the surface. And I well remember the original exploration manager of Aramco, chief geologist. He had no use for reflection seismology. He thought it was just a lot of black box stuff because he, f he could find all the oil that they could possibly drill for just on the basis of surface expressions of these, these uh, uh, subsurface formations. But he eventually came around to it when they ran out of these surface expressions. And then they had to depend upon reflection seismology, which, in a sense, provided the eyesight for the geologist. I have a cross-section here that was taken in the South Atlantic. This line represents a slice through the bottom of the South Atlantic Ocean, starting about 30 miles east of the Falkland Islands and going up to just about the eastern side of the Falklands. In order to handle the vast volumes of data that come in from the field, we have to use many of the world's largest computers, all working at full speed, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. These large machines can do 20 to 30 to 35 jobs all at once. They can operate on data from different areas at the same time and do billions of computations per second. If the only machines that were available to us were standard commercial computers, all the computers in the world would not suffice to carry us through a day's work. From around the world, data are collected and channeled to centers for processing, refinement, and interpretation. While most exploration data are collected and processed by contract geophysical firms, oil companies usually interpret the data and decide whether to drill. Whatever they've spent so far, one, two, ten million, now they must decide whether the prospect is a good risk or a poor one. If they elect to drill, they will be committing millions more. And they will decide on the strength of these pictures, which may be, should be, are, 
oil-bearing structures. Gravity, magnetic, and seismic data are combined to produce contour maps. Thus, billions of bits of information are translated and transposed into a small gallery, the final output of one of the world's most scientifically demanding pursuits. I'm showing part of the three-dimensional data set in the Prudhoe Bay area. And on this data set, after I adjust a few of the colors, we can see all of the trapping mechanisms that they were looking for in Prudhoe Bay. One of the trapping mechanisms was the lower Cretaceous unconformity, which is now being displayed. You can see the unconformity meandering across the surface of the cube, shown by the arrow. Along the south face, it dips to the east. This lower Cretaceous unconformity is a discontinuity. It's a, an erosional surface that cut across the main reservoir rocks. The discontinuity is around 100 to 130 million years old. The geologist knows rocks and their properties, the history of the Earth, the formation of its layers. The geologist determines whether conditions through geologic time might have produced a potential oil or gas habitat. The geophysicist, superbly qualified, is part physicist, part geologist, mathematician, and computer expert. More and more, it is teamwork between the geologist and the geophysicist which provides the data and the interpretation for the drilling decision. The heat is on them, and the risk is enormous. Yet the future of their company, and maybe the price of gasoline at the pump, or plastics, or perfume, or another thousand products that come from oil, may depend on their decision to drill or not to drill. In the great search for oil, interpretation is the end of the line. The Willow Island prospect, which we will review today, is located about 100 miles west of New Orleans in southern Louisiana. It's what we call the Salt Marsh area. It's an area that Exxon has explored in in the past, and we've had some success. That does not necessarily mean that, that we're going to drill a lot of successful wildcats. Fred, today we're here to discuss the possible drilling of our Willow Island prospect. As you remember, any well that's drilled has a high risk of being dry, and it's extremely important that we look at every geophysical and geological aspect of a prospect before we decide whether or not it should be drilled. Some of the dramatic thinning from down off structure on the structure, which is indicative that the structure was growing during the deposition of these sediments, which makes it, uh, oh, puts it in good favor for hydrocarbon maturation and migration. So let me to try to uh, summarize. Before you move on, Tim, uh, I realize you've got growth here, but when that happens, isn't there also a possibility that these sands may not be present as you're coming up on the higher part of the structure? With the thinning, you're going to lose some sand, but I think when Mark talks about the sand story, you'll see that there's going to be plenty of reservoir sand available. Okay. So, in essence, from this section, I've showed you that we've got good control on the fault, We've got growth on the fault, and we've got thinning onto our structure. If I could, I'd like to show you one more seismic line okay. to demonstrate some of these same features. We're talking about a well that will cost at least $10 million to drill and complete. When you're talking about that kind of money, you have to be sure that you have checked all the possible data in order to lower the risk as much as possible in finding oil and gas. What I'd like to do now is to show you a type log for our Willow Island prospect. This will be the Exxon number one, and it's located in this field area about four miles to the east. Porosities are upwards of 20 percent. Water saturations are in the neighborhood of 20 percent. And the permeabilities for this depth of about 14 and a half thousand feet are very good to allow these substantial flow rates. When Tim and Mark reviewed this area for me, they talked about the large reserve here, which is quite good. 
uh, they did not mention this smaller field here up to the north. I asked them, you know, is it possible that our prospect could be the same size as this field? If that's the kind of reserve we're looking for, it would be very margin marginal as to whether or not we could make money on it. I felt like that they had either overlooked this or did not want to bring it to my attention. Okay, now there's one thing that both of y'all have avoided at this point. You talked about this large field over here, which has substantial reserves. I notice this field here has much smaller reserves. Now, if we have the same type of reserves here that we have here, my question is, can we afford to drill this test? Fred, this field to the north <clears throat> is smaller only because the sands are much thinner to the north. From the, our regional studies of the sand patterns, it appears that the southern part of the map is much more sand prone than the northern part, and that's why we have a, a little rattier production to the north. We don't think that that's as much a risk as, uh, as I'm getting a feeling that you think it might be. We think we'll be in an environment much closer to the uh, field right here. Okay, uh, Kathy, let's take a look at our land situation. Red, the uh, by outline is this outline here in yellow, the wider outline. And we uh, have been trying to buy this leases in this prospect for nearly 10 years. It took us 10 years to put the prospect together. Red, I would not want to have us delayed the drilling of this well. I feel we would really have a difficult time renewing that lease. Lessor under that lease is a little old man about 75 years old, and he lives uh, about 10 miles from here up to the north. Now, you remember I mentioned it took us nearly 10 years to put this prospect together. Well, the first five years we spent just trying to get the little old man to let us set foot on his property. Um, he, then when we were able to talk to him, he, he just, we found out he didn't like to sign any papers. He took us a long time to get him to sign. In fact, the lease broker ended up having to spend nearly every night for about six months playing blackjack with him just to get him to sign the lease. So uh, you want to keep that in mind, and I, I really don't feel like we could probably get a renew, renewal from this. Oil and gas are increasingly difficult to find, and it takes more manpower to find less and less oil and gas, and that's with the use of computers. One element that ex is extremely important is creativity. A geophysicist and a geologist need to be creative in their work. You can take the same person or the same data with two different people, and the person that's creative will find you more oil and gas prospects than the person that is not created. So difficult is a search that less than one exploratory well on every six which are drilled finds any oil or gas. An even smaller number finds enough to be economically productive. There's a beautiful anticline out in the northern part of Western Australia. Shows up on the surface of the earth and shows up very nicely in the seismic work. When the company first went out to explore there in the early 1950s, they drilled a hole right on top of the anticline, and the very first well hit oil. Unfortunately, that was the last oil we found in the area because we drilled a whole bunch of other holes all around it, one only a couple hundred feet away. And what we discovered was that instead of having a whole anticline full of oil, we only had a little pimple on top of the anticline full of oil. An example that we thought initially was a great success turned out to be a dismal failure and cost us many millions of dollars. I spent a long time out in Western Australia working in the very early 1960s, and during that time drilled a number of wells which failed. We invested a tremendous amount of money in the area. Eventually, we succeeded. The company tolerated my failure fact, we expect failure because it's not wrong, it's not a sin to fail. The only thing that is unforgivable is to give up on the proposition and have someone else come in and find oil where you gave up. The vision of success has to exceed the risk of failure. Pete's map really didn't change even with the drilling of uh, several wells in the Prudhoe Bay 
field. However, the quality of the data we had in those days was nowhere near like what we get today. But the interpretation held up, and it's held up the 20 years since, as a matter of fact. This is a north-south line through the uh, seismic data set. South is off on the left-hand side of the screen. North is on the right-hand side. The original seismic data that they interpreted to find the Prudhoe field was single-fold uh, analog recorded seismic data. Uh, the they had lines that were spaced 15 miles apart, tried to interpret those lines and then project into the Prudhoe Bay area what they thought the structure was. What we have today is a full three-dimensional data set. That is, we have lines that are spaced within, say, 50 feet of each other and trace spacings in the lines that are 50 feet so that we can get an actual three-dimensional image of the structure. Uh, the kind of interpretation that they did back then involved a tremendous amount of art in order and imagination in order to come up with the kind of structure that, that they actually came up with. In this 3D data set, we are actually presented with the structure in the data itself. We're looking down on seismic data at a depth of about 7,500 or 8,000 feet in the Prudhoe Bay area. The computer is in the process of putting 16 horizontal slices of the seismic data on the uh, terminal screen at the same time. These slices follow one another in depth, so that if we look at the top slice and then move down, looking at each slice after that, we will essentially be gradually looking deeper and deeper into the earth. Now we're back to the starting time, or the starting depth. We can move through them more quickly to get something that looks more like a movie view of the image. And then it loops through these 16 and then circles around and starts back up at the top. That's why it seems to jump back after a time. The orange horizon was corrupted, the orange file. So you're going to have to go back in and unload each of the vintages okay. separately with a different shot point interval for each um, vintage data. What we're doing is here is entering the map making portion of the interpretation process. And so the first step of that is to input the interpreted seismic data into the Integraph system. So to do this, we use our mouse as we input fault breaks and well as the interpreted horizon here in case the orange. And you'll notice up on the right-hand screen as I'm working, the horizon is being drawn or the event. We've all worked on this in great detail for two years. At this point, this is the end of the interpretation. All the work by the geologists and geophysicists on the interpretation team has ended. The technical analysis can proceed no further. We're essentially at the point where it is up to management to decide now whether or not to drill this prospect. This prospect the interpretation team and the geologists feel very strongly about and is up to us to attempt to convince management that this is indeed a good place to spend their money. Yeah, I think we've covered uh, most of the concerns that I have with this prospect. I certainly think the new seismic was a big help because I believe it did clearly evident, uh, show evidence that we do have the fault present. I think there's some risk on the sand, but from a land standpoint, I feel that it's either now or never. We're in a good area. We've got some good production around here, and I think that we ought to drill it. Putting that kind of a picture together is, of course, what, what we're trained for, and uh, we spend years learning how to do it, and it becomes uh, uh, the solution is maybe not as important to us as the process. And that's strange for other people to uh, understand. I think we enjoy putting all these pieces together and, and getting them to fit into something that we see grow over a period of time so that when the solution comes, it's almost anticlimactic. Of course, the big solution is, is drilling that eventual hole in the ground and seeing if we, if we put all the pieces together correctly. But it's a, uh, it's a fascinating thing, and it has its scary aspects at times, but it's really a fun thing to do. And this was the most fun I ever had in exploration, no question about it. Then. 
As geophysicists interpret the seismic sections, we see deep into the geologic past. Then, in our mind's eye, we see, perhaps, a delta. You see the lush vegetation, the dank humidity, and the great prehistoric animals roaming, crashing their way through the undergrowth, fighting. And perhaps we see in that delta the habitat of oil. Perhaps we say, yes, this is a prospect. Drill here. And they drill. And from three miles down in the earth, they bring up a piece of rock which has not seen the light of day for a hundred million years. And there, in that rock, is the footprint of a dinosaur. Only easy oil has been discovered. What's left is a limited supply exceedingly hard to find. What's left, under the best conditions, using the most advanced scientific methods, may still never be found. What's left is not a pool of oil a couple of hundred feet down that somebody sticks a giant soda straw into. What's left is tucked away in hidden traps deep within the earth, cleverly disguised by nature's geologic handiwork in an endless maze of subtleties. That's where tomorrow's energy is hidden. <laughs>